Senegal is surrounded by radical Islamic nations, Mali to the east, Nigeria to the east and south, Libya to the north and east, all subjected to violence and human suffering and under siege from extremist anti-Western Islamic movements such as Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram. Radical religious beliefs, ancient traditions, and educational prejudices against women are the norm. Yet Senegal, another Islamic nation with a population of some 15 million, remains peaceful. Donc c'est la philosophie que nous développons au niveau du Sénégal. C'est pourquoi il n'y a pas de place pour ce qui est d'Al-Qaïda, des, des théories comme ça. Slam, ça vient du mot slam qui veut dire paix. Donc tout ce qui est tuerie, tout ce qui est barbarie, ça c'est totalement exclu de l'islam. Et elles ont une place centrale dans l'éducation. Et c'est elles qui gèrent l'éducation des, 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 des enfants. De Mouride a Sufi brand of Islam, which is practiced in Senegal, is a religion of peace, kindness, and friendship, and is a primary reason for the lack of violence and warlike behavior in the country. We had the opportunity to interview Serin Bas Abdul Khadr Mbake, the spokesman for the Grand Khalif of the Murid Sufi Brotherhood of Senegal. <laughs> Senegal is a devoutly Muslim country. Religion plays a very important role in Senegalese life. Radical Islam gets all the attention these days, but many Muslims, such as the Senegalese, are not part of that. This is of great significance for women, particularly to the extent they have influenced its applications. It is often in the Islamic schools in the radicalized countries that young boys become extremists. But it is in schools such as this one where the true tenets of Islam are taught at the insistence of the mothers of the boys where Senegal's peaceful character is formed. The mothers simply do not want and will not allow their sons to be raised to kill themselves for distant and dangerous causes. It is a place where women have emerged as a new force playing an ever-increasing role in the future of their country. This new reality is the result of a long and hard struggle against traditional and religious restriction. Their victories are testament to their determination and perseverance in the face of sometimes huge obstacles. They have refused to back down. They have fought for their economic, political, and human rights. And the result is the Senegal we witness today. This is the story about that nation, but particularly about its women. How they have coped with traditional challenges and how they have struggled to succeed in a not always friendly world. The city of Dakar is central to their lives. It's the economic and political hub of the country. A scant 50 years ago, it had a few hundred thousand inhabitants. Today, it's a teeming city of over two million. 
In rural Senegal, for generations, life in its small villages would appear unchanged. But that is not so. For example, the women of village of Banen Serer do the same chores their ancestors did and work hard with all other family members in agricultural fields. Family ties are strengthened. <laughs> But today, it's the women of the village who earn much of its income, who organize their community to respond to needs. Fatou Bayan and Amin Yai are leaders of the village cooperative community. Economic power flows through her and her allies. She is forthright in speaking about human rights, health, and education problems. Nothing escapes her scrutiny. However, while she may be the economic power, she's not likely to seek her fortune away from the village because her husband would not approve. So traditional family ties remain strong with both positive and negative effect. Urban Senegal surprises the unexpected observer. It appears open, relaxed, and free of rancor and divisiveness. The city of Dakar, capital of Senegal, is a lively place with all the spirit, hustle and bustle of any Western city. Our first surprise came when we took a local ferry boat to the island of Gore. The calm, cool and collected captain, deftly steering the boat within a very crowded harbor, was a woman, Khadiba. None of this would have been possible, however, were it not for the strength of women leaders who struggled and still struggle against ancient traditions, which restricted their freedom in subtle ways, religious strictures which might have limited their interpersonal relationships and social customs which may have restrained their mobility. We spoke with one of Senegal's leading advocates for women's rights, Marie-Angélique Savané, a person whose strength and character were formed as long ago as 1968. She was a student in Paris and observed the tumultuous student rights which took place on behalf of human rights. These proved to be a turning point for many women. Marie-Angélique speaks eloquently and forcefully about women's rights and what it took for Senegalese women to achieve their current status. She's a Catholic, and her husband, a past candidate for the presidency, is a Muslim. So that's where I started. But then I was politically involved in the student movement, in the 68th movement. This is where really I can say this shape all my life. Because in a way, I start understanding that life was not that easy as I thought. That difficulties arose mainly when you were a woman, just because you were a woman. And I was studying in France at the university there. So I, I have been quite influenced by uh, this uh, French philosopher and feminist, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, you don't, uh, you are not born as a woman, you become a woman. And this was the turning point of my life where at that point, everything changed. This is the story whereby I realized in the 70s when the United Nations declared 75, the International Year of Women, that something has to be done. 
Here, the Islamic Brotherhood has been very good because they were more into spirituality, you know. And this is, for me, what has saved Senegal. Uh, religion has never been linked to politics. We were the first country in Africa to have the first family law that was taking into account women's rights. We wrote articles responding point by point. We are as Senegalese are you, as you are, we are as uh, involved we are in culture as you are, but we think that culture should move. We think that religion should also take into account the reality of today's. We went to school with you, you are not better than us. We have job like you have, and we are doing quite well. So why don't you give us uh, equal access to opportunities? That was all. Many women benefited from efforts such as these, but each in her own way has followed similar path to recognition and personal success. Such is the story of Sornadia Nseimbake, who fled her homeland and her rural environment, struggled against ingrained family traditions, but ended up as a US citizen with a life of her own in a vastly different society proud of her accomplishments, but also missing her home and the security of family and friends. Yeah, from Durban to the States. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> That's me. A lot of memories. This is what I used to come as a, when I was a student. Uh, but my dad was kind of hiding me because he didn't know people to know that I was going to the Western school. Sohna Yang came from a very religious family. Her father was high in the Muslim hierarchy. I stayed in the state. Uh, I stayed in the states for quite some time. And I, actually, before coming to the states, my father has um, taken my green card and <laughs> shredded it because he didn't want me to go back because he said that the states had changed me because the fact that I got married without letting him know was already. So I was like ostracized, I was like a pariah in the house. And I went to the embassy, they wrote a letter, which is a soft conduit, because I didn't have my green card. And then I, they uh, let me leave for the States again. That was the best story of my life. And this is in this room over here that used to be a hut that I was born in. A lot of memories, a lot of memories, a lot of good memories. Unfortunately, my mom is no longer here to be here with me. <sighs> no, I won't cry. She's happy with her life in America, but one can understand why she misses her home. Compare preparing a meal in the U.S. with preparing a meal with a family in Dakar. Thanks to women such as Sohna Dianse Mbake, Senegalese women can raise their children with the same dreams of a peaceful and safe existence. The biggest problem for women in Senegal today are not of religious zealotry, but of ancient traditions. These remain strongest in the rural countryside, where change is difficult and isolation of communities makes communication more difficult. Child marriages and female genital cutting are the two most prominent practices still being fought today. But women have taken the lead in changing these deeply embedded traditional practices. Often the strongest resistance comes from the girls themselves. Tradition has taught them through the centuries that their worth is diminished, that no one will marry them, and they will not have children if they have not been genitally cut. To see how these advances are achieved, we visited the village of Kersimbara. It's an example of how even the most tradition-bound rural community is awakening to realize its own potential. Great support and encouragement has come from a highly motivated NGO, 
Tosta. Um, my name is Molly Melching, and I'm the director of the non-governmental organization Tostan, which has its headquarters here in Senegal, but we are in eight African countries working um, to bring basic education to communities, to community members who have never been able to go to school, so lots of women, men also, but also many adolescents, particularly adolescent girls who were not able to attend school or who were taken out of school when they were 11 or 12 to get married or um, to go through female genital cutting, uh, and so they had to drop out of school. So we are working to give them that information they need in a three-year program uh, that just changes their lives. Uh, really, this has been so critical in the work we've done because so many women and young girls did not know they had the right to participate, to speak out. Uh, they didn't know they had the right to health, the right to be free from all forms of violence. And learning this and learning that they not only had these rights but also certain responsibilities uh, helped them to become confident and very, very proactive. She said, that girl that I gave birth to, who was given to my older sister, was taken by my older sister when she was three years old to the Lul, which is the ceremony where they do the cutting. And afterwards, I was told that she had died. And then at 18, I had another child, a girl. Her name was Aji Kumba. So she, I had her for seven years. Seven years she was by my side. And she didn't want her to go to get cut, but because it's expected, it has you have to do it. And, and without my knowing, when I went to get fetch water, they took her. And they took her to the ceremony without my knowing it. And that's when she, they took her there, they did her, the tradition to her, and she died. They're the ones who discuss this and say, wait a minute. Pra these practices we did because we found them here, our ancestors practiced them, but do they really help us our, achieve our goals of today? Uh, and through that dialogue and discussion with the religious leaders, with the traditional leaders, with the health workers, um, they come to the decision to abandon these practices that they realize no longer help them uh, to get where they want to be in the future. Clearly, the terrible and dangerous practice of female genital cutting still persists. A few years ago, perhaps 80, 90% of young girls were subjected to it. Now, it's in the single digits. Similarly, child brides are now a rarity. Not too long ago, children aged as young as nine or 10 were given off in marriage. Many died very young. Senegal passed laws making this a crime. In neighboring Mali, where Al-Qaeda is very strong, one finds both practices still almost universal. And of course, in today's vicious terrorism, so often directed against women, the situation could not be worse. With the door slowly opening and knowledge spreading slowly, the women of Tostan blazed a path to bring progress to their village. Such efforts are slowly being replicated in other villages. One such leader is Dusu Konate. She managed to get a grant to study in India. Six months later, she came back proudly bearing the title of solar engineer, possibly the first woman to achieve such distinction in Senegal. Dafenana, <laughs> 
The leader of the village has had such impact that he's become a true spokesman for equal opportunity, for fairness, kindness, and thoughtfulness. Senegal is not cursed by enormous natural wealth. As a nation of traders, all through history, the Senegalese have been known as businessmen, not warriors. They have had to earn their living by hard work, not by exploitation of natural resources. France's big influence as a colonizing power needs to be recognized as well. No one can question the importance of French fashion in the world. So it is not surprising that many African women look upon fashion as a route to success and are well known for their elegance and good style. Their acceptance by the French fashion industry has been of utmost importance. To find out how this has worked, we met with a Senegalese woman engaged in this industry, Binta Salsao. She was frank in telling us of the hurdles she encountered, as well as the opportunities which came her way. She speaks of the childhood dream and the role of her mother in her success. For the women, it was difficult because, the regime, the regime ancien, ne tenait pas compte de la mode. Ça n'avait aucune espèce d'importance. Au niveau du Sénégal, par exemple, quand on, quand on devait exposer à l'étranger, on n'était pas encadré. En général, d'après ce que j'entends, 
autour de moi, on dit toujours qu'elles sont plus élégantes. En ce moment, c est, c est, la balance est vraiment équitable. Mais à, à un moment donné, j'avais beaucoup plus de clients européens que de clients africains. Other women have seen their dreams and aspirations evolve in different ways. Most important in Senegal is the world of music. The nation has long been recognized worldwide as a genuine leader in this field. It has proven to be an important avenue for advancement for women. We were fortunate to meet Aida Samp, a young woman seeking recognition on a worldwide stage. Her past was not easy either, but her natural talents helped greatly. We caught her as she prepared to perform at the National Cultural Center. She told us that being a woman created special obstacles. Despite strong family support, some family elders were fearful of her involvement in this field. But she was well received in Paris. That, plus the success of her first recording, was a big boost to her career. Je fais de la musique traditionnelle parce que je suis née dans une famille euh, gaulo. Alors que tous mes ancêtres euh, ont fait de la musique, mais la musique traditionnelle. Il y a pas mal de problèmes que l'on que l'on que l'on rencontre dans le dans le milieu showbiz ici au Sénégal. C'est pas facile, pas surtout facile. dans nos familles. Euh, ils pratiquent euh, euh, la religion musulmane avec ton accoutrement, surtout avec mon grand-père, c'est pas évident. Oui. Tout ce que je porte, il va me dire ceci, cela, c'est pas bien, il faut faire ceci, il faut faire cela. Mais alhamdoulilah, euh, je remercie le bon Dieu d'avoir d'avoir une bonne famille, d'avoir une bonne famille qui me soutienne. Et voilà. Quels sont tes plans pour le futur Au fait, moi, j'avais vraiment une rêve. Euh, à bas, c'était de chanter avec la chanteuse américaine Beyoncé. To validate the importance of music in Senegal's cultural prominence, we also spoke with Ma Keita, an albino, the only woman in the Takeifa family combo. She is now gaining an international reputation in her case as well, family help, support, and protection did much to make her career possible. She is optimistic and points to the many advances Senegalese women have made. The prime minister and the head of the police are women, as she points out. The difficulty comes from. No, you see, you know why I didn't have any difficulties because I was a woman? Because I was very protected by my friends. Because if I was in another group, if I was in another group, it would be very difficult for me. The other women who do music here know what I'm talking about. But I've always been super protected by my friends. Not surprisingly, Senegal is a very important industry. Tourism has also opened many doors for women. They moved in quickly when men seemed indifferent to the opportunities the industry offered. Cooks, guides, housekeepers, souvenir salespersons, all these jobs came open and offered many new opportunities for women. Visit the Senegalese Tourist Center and one can see why it is a tourist mecca. Tourists sunbathe and spend much money. And the Senegalese, particularly women marketers, are making a good profit. But even as the women's efforts have been crowned with impressive achievements, new and different challenges are emerging, often threatening both sexes and causing significant changes to the structure of Senegalese society. For instance, the historic economic backbone of the nation has been fishing off the coast of Senegal, and women have always played a big role. 
particularly in preparing and marketing the product. In the old days, fishing consisted of artisanal fishermen going to sea in their skiffs and small boats. Today, huge fishing factory ships from as far away as Japan, Russia, Korea and elsewhere, either legally or illegally, swoop into the rich traditional fishing grounds to suck up the fish. Their catch goes abroad and not to Senegal. Today, fishing still remains a key component of Senegal's economy. Fishermen voice their strong complaints about the foreign fishing vessels, but if the industry suffers, so will the population. Women often, being on the lower end of the economic scale, have to make bigger adjustments to their lives. A quick look at the fish market reveals how important is the role of women. They always have done much of the marketing and sales, even if it's in a simple village marketplace. Now, fish are landed and sent far away without even approaching the Senegalese landmass. Another challenge to accepted norms has been the sudden disruptions caused by the large influx of Chinese investment and workers. For generations, the marketplace was a major source of income for women. They sold inexpensive products produced locally or imported from established markets in Europe, the USA, and elsewhere. But suddenly, waves of Chinese laborers arrived to build Chinese finance projects. When they finished, these workers did not return home. Instead, they set themselves up in small shops, selling cheap Chinese products at very low cost. They were supported by an aggressive Chinese government, which worked hard to obtain popular support. A backlash against the Chinese is developing, and it remains to be seen how the situation will resolve itself. One aspect of Senegal's history which has left its mark on its entire population and colors every aspect of its psyche, male and female, its terrible history as a slave center for the world. One cannot visit Senegal or even discuss its current status in the family of nations without visiting the island of Gore and seeing firsthand how slavery influence the lives of so many people. To take the ferry from Dakar to Gore, from whence so many slaves departed for a life of servitude far away, is to realize how profoundly tragic is the history of people of African origin. It's interesting to visit the historic quarters used by the slave traders and merchants. One can see up the stairs where they dined. Just below were the slave quarters, behind thick walls, which deadened any noise and with bars to prevent escape. Food was passed down to the slaves through the bars. The slaves themselves descended to their quarters via ladders, which were then pulled up by their masters. We see a rapidly evolving nation with new horizons, new opportunities, open to women and men alike, yet we also see the struggles women must still go through to fully achieve their dreams. Senegal's future rests on growing harmony, diminishing conflict, and increased opportunity. The doors are opening thanks to women such as Marie-Angélique, Sornadiagne, Binta, Aida, Ma Keita, and Dusu. Peace and tranquility on the continent are possible. If the Senegalese example can be replicated in some way, it will take a lot of patience and determination by the women of Africa, but it offers a promise of peace. The women of Senegal have stood up against cruel traditions which have degraded women, and they have won. They have refused to allow their sons to go to schools which teach violence, and they have won.
They have struggled against male domination in economic and commercial fields, and they have won. They have fought against human rights violations and abuse of women, and they have won. They have fought for independence and freedom of choice, and they have won. As stated by the U.S. ambassador, well, I just think Senegal is a, an amazing country, a great example to the world and to, and to the rest of Africa that good governance and transparency and peaceful democracy are possible. It's a great example of, a, of an Islamic nation that's at peace with itself and at peace with its neighbors and is a very, very good and close ally of the United States. Women are against violence because you don't, uh, they, you, you know, when you, you create something, as we do create human beings, you want those people to be happy. You want them to, to have a decent life, not to go to be killed. So women, naturally, I can say women are anti-violence. <laughs>